mais um, uma sessão dos nossos seminários em doenças crônicas e infecciosas, uma iniciativa da Universidade Federal de Paraná, com apoio de várias instituições e universidades do Brasil e de fora do país. A gente tem hoje eh, uma, eh, uma convidada estrangeira e eu vou eh, deixar nas mãos para, eh, como moderadora, como chairman, a, a professora e pesquisadora Teca Galvão eh, eh, Calcaño, de eh, o Instituto Valdo Cruz, eh, Fio Cruz, Rio de Janeiro. Mas antes de tudo, eu vou começar com essa sessão para conhecer aos alunos e eh, vamos a começar com eh, Rodrigo. Olá, boa tarde. Tudo, Tudo bom, bem? Rodrigo? Bom, pessoal, meu nome é Rodrigo, eu sou aluno de doutorado há um ano pelo Programa de Pós-Graduação em Biologia Celular e Molecular do IOC, na Fiocruz, aqui do Rio de Janeiro. Eu entrei no laboratório em 2017, desde então, né, é, orientado pela doutora Teca Galvão, e desde lá nós é, vemos trabalhando na avaliação né, do impacto de mutações em um regulador transcricional de micobactéria tuberculose em resistência à etionamida, né, que é um fármaco de segunda linha utilizado em, em casos de infecções por cepas resistentes. E aí, basicamente, muita biomol, o básico de biomol que todo mundo faz, mas o que a gente mais trabalha é clonagem e expressão e purificação de proteínas. Ótimo, Rodrigo. E como está sendo essa vida aí na Fiocruz? Já abriram? Está todo mundo trabalhando no laboratório? Não, ainda nem senti o gostinho do doutorado. Desde que eu entrei no doutorado, eu estou preso em casa. Já tomei a primeira dose, esperando a segunda em outubro, para poder finalmente voltar a trabalhar. Bom, espero que volte logo. A pandemia vai acabar um dia e esperamos que o Brasil não continue com esses números e a gente possa trabalhar com tranquilidade. Tá? Para ser Rodrigo, aproveitei o um momento de teca aqui no, de na, para moderar, para te fazer o convite. É tá? um prazer. Obrigado, Marcelo. Prazer. Uhum. Agora eu queria Eduardo. Pode me ouvir? Pode, pode. pode. Eduardo, se quiser abrir a, a câmera. Uh, vou tentar. Uh, sorry, it's a bit. Just uh, a bit. No, don't worry, and you call uh, talking in English if it's better for you. I'll try my best in Portuguese just to be polite, but there might be some English thrown in, because just in case. Uh, Okay. Okay. Don't um, worry about the video if if you uh, don't have the possibility. No, don't worry. I mean, the green light's on. It's just giving me this weird icon with a, a camera with a line across it. So I'm not quite sure what to do with that. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. In any case, um, uh, boa tarde, gente. Meu nome é Eduardo Longoria. Uh, sou de Estados Unidos, originalmente, eu cidade Austin. Uh, eu cheguei no Brasil no 2019. Uh, e eu comecei uh, meu mestrado uh, na biologia celular uh, last year. Uh, e meu projeto uh, para o mestrado para uh, biosensor uh, color colorométrico. Uh, um, uh, for uh, COVID-19, uh, making use of the spike protein on the surface of the viron. Uh, the idea being I can use gold nanoparticles and they will aggregate uh, when exposed to the spike protein and be able to have a shift from red to blue when exposed to the virus. Um, what The other things I was supposed to talk about, or did that cover, did that cover it? Ok, Eduardo. So, uh, uh, who is your supervisor? Oh, uh, Carolina Camargo de Oliveira. Ah, ok. Nice. Nice, Eduardo. So, uh, uh, you are a very international student in our room. So, thank you very much for your uh, presentation and good luck with your project. Obrigado. Um, I, I hope that was what you were looking for. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, eh, ya, ya casi se presentaron todos los alumnos. Están faltando algunos. Tenemos la última sesión la próxima semana. Voy a comenzar con el seminario. 
Vamos a desear las manos de la profesora, pesquisadora Teca Calcaño, de, de, de IOC Fiocruz Río de Janeiro, y ella va a presentar a nuestra convidada de hoy. Teca, es con vos la palabra y fique a voluntad para organizar la discusión durante el seminario. Obrigada, Marcel. So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, today, we're having a lecture from Dr. Muriel Massi. She is um, a researcher and lecturer at uh, University Paris-Saclay. And um, she has um, done lots of research on how small molecules come in and out of bacterial cells, um, the different types of transport systems that bacteria use to transport small molecules like antibiotics. And um, because her work has um, such broad uh, types of uh, experimental uh, approaches, I thought it would be interesting here so that people who maybe are not too familiar with how bacteria live, um, could both get an idea of um, issues related with antimi antimicrobial resistance, but also experimental approaches that today are very useful in uh, bacteriology in a broader sense. Um, personally, I'd say that today, um, very exciting bacteriology research actually includes genetics, structural biology, biochemistry, and I think that um, Dr. Massey's work really uh, shows this well. And um, also, it's very interesting that her work, um, part of it, is on these um, very widespread um, bacterial signaling modules called two component systems. And uh, today, the title of her lecture is on how um, bacterial two-component systems have a role in antimicrobial resistance because antibiotics will cause damage to bacteria and they'll try to respond before dying or surviving. And so we'll hear about some of that. And um, Michiel, so if you'd like to um, take questions during the talk, please let us know and we will be happy anyway to ask them at the end. Feel free. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, especially knowing that it's 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Stika, for this very nice introduction. Um, I'm very glad to be here today. I never been to Brazil before, but it's I feel like I'm going to Brazil tonight. Um, so I guess I can upload um, my presentation. Um, yes, please. Um, we didn't try that, did we, before we started, just to see how no, we did. Yeah, well, let's see. I tried to do it. Um, I tried to share my screen, but I can't. Oh. It doesn't let did me you, do it. Okay, so did you find below the screen? Yes. There's this little, with this arrow pointing upwards? Yes, there is an so arrow. Click there. You, can, you should then choose share whole screen instead okay. of a particular panel. Okay. Or something like, I'm not sure the exact words, but that would be close to what you need. Because you can either share the a specific window or the whole screen, and then you can just go to the to the talk. I can share the whole screen, um, but I cannot click on share. <laughs> you ah, Marcel, does she need to be able to share her screen? Does she need to be a co-host as well? I think it's open for everyone, but los estudiantes pueden ayudar si la gente ya ya tiene problemas. So if I uh, you have some difficulty now, uh, we have a lot of students to help us. So uh, try to 
So what about your screening uh, and you look the chair? Uh, yes, but I cannot click on, on share. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I, I have no any restriction for everyone. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't know really what happened now. So, but uh, take care, we have a little bit time. So, uh, I don't know how sort out this problem. Let me see if it works. Uh, just a specific application. Um, can you see something? Yes, yeah. something is coming. Fantastic. Okay, okay, it's going. It's coming? Yeah, we can yeah. see your screen now. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> okay, so, well, good afternoon, everyone. So, I am a microbiologist, and so, as um, uh, Teka said, I, I study antibiotic resistance in gram-negative bacteria and try to develop new antibacterial compounds. And today, I will uh, present part of the work I performed while I was a research associate not at Paris-Saclay, but at Aix-Marseille University on uh, envelope stress responses and regulation of antibiotic resistance, and specifically on the, the system that is called CPX. So these studies and uh, others were funded uh, by a European program called New Drugs for Bad Bugs, and our lab uh, contributed to topic two. I don't know if I can have a... Um, a a pointer or like um, something to we can see your hand your little okay. hand <laughs> so it's we like... contributed to to topic two here translocation which aimed at investigating how antibiotics get across the envelope of uh, gram negative bacteria in order to better understand the molecular basis of resistance and therefore guide the rational design of novel antibacterial compounds so as you may be aware of, the discovery of natural antibiotics and the development of synthetic uh, molecules at a golden age between 1940 and uh, 1960. But since uh, 1990, the industry has experienced a very um, a real shortage of new molecules. And at the same time, uh, bacteria have developed uh, several uh, mechanisms of resistance, leading in some cases to uh, therapeutic uh, failure. In gram-negative bacteria, um, there are four uh, different ways to uh, become resistant to antibiotics. And one can note that um, target mutations or drug inactivation are specific for a given family of antibiotics. On the other hand, um, outer membrane impermeability, as well as efflux, which are often co-regulated in bacteria, affect several families of antibiotics and therefore lead to the emergence of multidrug resistance. In addition, what we know is that clinical strains often combine uh, several mechanisms of resistance, and this results in very high level of resistance. So I did not mention, but you can ask questions between the present during the presentation. So the envelope of gram-negative bacteria uh, represent an, in, an intrinsic barrier to the accumulation and therefore the antibacterial activity of antibiotics. However, uh, to be active, antibiotics must reach a sufficient concentration in the vicinity of the intracellular target. And this concentration is controlled by two op opposite fluxes so in one hand, there is a limited passive diffusion across the outer membrane. And on the other hand, you have an active efflux of antibiotics from the inside to the outside medium. Therefore, as a result, uh, clinical isolates with multidrug resistance often exhibit overexpression of efflux pumps here that get across the, the entire cell envelope. And, um, uh, down regulation of uh, points that uh, are used as a route for penetration across the outer membrane. 
So one of the objectives of the translocation project was the identification of novel antibacterial targets that control uh, envelope permeability. So if you have a very simple point of view, uh, bacteria are resistant to antibiotics because their envelope is not or very poorly permissive to antibiotic translocation. Therefore, the question uh, becomes how to restore drug accumulation and susceptibility in these bacteria. So we know we can act on uh, multidrug reflux systems with uh, specific inhibitors, but I will not go into this detail uh, today. But we can also act on outer me membrane porins, which represent a facilitated route for entry of antibiotics across the cell envelope. And for this, what we wanted to do is to identify and connect uh, porin regulatory factors by using an approach of uh, clinical relevance. And these factors could then be targeted uh, by therapeutic adjuvants. So here we started with uh, a series of clinical strains of uh, Enterobacter aerogenes. Uh, which was recently renamed as Klebsiella aerogenes, which was isolated from patients and, uh, under treatment with imipenem. Imipenem is a potent carbapenem uh, from the family of beta-lactams. So first, uh, in order to identify mutations that were acquired sequentially during the treatment and therefore contributed to the resistance, we sequenced and compared their genome. In the second step, the identified mutations were individually introduced in E. coli K12, a laboratory strain, in order to study their impact on bacterial physiology using bacterial genetics and biochemistry, and thus validate them as new uh, attractive targets. So in this first study that I will present today, we uh, reported the identification of genome mutations in relation with multidrug resistance in Enterobacter aerogenes. So using a standard de determination of minimal inhibitory concentration of antibiotics, we found that all the strains were resistant to fluoroquinolones, a class of antibiotics, and this resistance was not reversible by using efflux pump inhibitors. And this suggested, uh, this suggested the presence of target mutations. Indeed, what we know is that fluoroquinolones are very good substrates for uh, efflux pump. At the opposite, the resistance to beta-lactams, including uh, carbapenem, was uh, reversible and linked to the imipenem treatment suggesting uh, that the strain encountered reversible changes of the envelope permeability. Therefore, we set up numbers of assays uh, to investigate antibiotic uptake uh, and efflux. So um, if you want, I can go into details for these assays, but I guess this is not really the point here. But we can come back to these assays uh, later if you want to. So to investigate antibiotic uptake, uh, we uh, did porin identification here. And we also uh, set up an assay for a specific dye here, the hushed um, dye. Uh, what we found is that there is no real um, difference between the strain. And we also set up assays for analyzing efflux in the strains. So these assays including included the, 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 the testing of ACRA level. ACRA is one of the main protein involved in efflux pumps. We also uh, uh, set up assays for fluoroquinolone accumulation, as well as real-time efflux assays in this strain. But what is important to uh, remember from these assays is that we concluded that there was no uh, detectable increase of efflux activities in the strain. And we concluded, therefore, that the porin loss, especially that of, of OMP35, uh, which is the ortholog of E. coli OMPF, a big porin in the outer membrane of this um, bacteria, was the main factor responsible for high level of resistance to beta-lactam, including uh, that of carbapenems. 
So uh, in, in the next step, what we did is that we did um, whole genome sequencing um, of the clinical strain G7, which was susceptible to beta lactams. And we uh, then did comparative genomics to the other strains to identify multidrug resistance markers. Some of them were really obvious, such as a mutation in JAR-A and PAR-C, which encode DNA JARAs and topo isomerase 4, which are targets for fluoroquinolones. We also identified a plasmidic uh, broad spectrum beta lactamase and chromosomal AMC, another beta lactamase, as, as enzymes that degrade beta lactams in the strains. And we also identified uh, stop codons uh, mutations in genes that uh, encode outer membrane points, uh, which are called OM35 and OM36. However, what, what was really interesting is that we also identified point mutations in reg regulatory genes that could account for porn loss in the beta-lactam resistant strains. And interestingly, so three of them uh, mapped into genes encoding the sensor kinase of two component systems, here CPXA, FOQ, and PMRB, which are known to remodel uh, the composition of the bacterial envelope in response to different external stresses. What you can see here is that uh, on one hand, the CPX system targets uh, the, the control of the biogenesis of outer membrane proteins, enzymatic uh, modification of the peptidoglycan, and inner membrane transporters, including influx pumps. On the other hand, uh, the FOPQ and PMR AB system are interconnected and target um, LPS modification enzymes. So in the following slide, I will present uh, the data concerning the characterization of the mutation we identified, uh, which is the Y1442N. Uh, and this identification was uh, in a beta lactam resistant strain and specifically in strain that we call P4. P is for patient P and four is the number of the isolate. So what is important on this slide is that uh, during the last decade, uh, several studies have provided uh, links between the CPX locus and the secretion of extracytoplasmic proteins. So very briefly, uh, people identified uh, gain of function mutations of CPXA that are, we called CPXA star. That are, that are able to suppress the toxicity associated with misfolded or mislocalized uh, extracytoplasmic proteins. And these mutations uh, are, are known to activate the CPX envelope stress response system and cause the overexpression of periplasmic um, um, protease, which is not shown here. Uh, well, yes, it's DECP, as well as chaperones such as PPRA. What is also in important here is to note that the overexpression of um, this outer membrane lipoprotein, NLPE, also activates the CPX um, response. So consistent with previous results, we first show that the activity of a PPIA uh, reporter fusion increased um, uh, by, two, by two or threefold in response to the overexpression of an LPE and previously characterized as CPXA star proteins. What we found is that similar activation was observed when the novel CPXA Y1442N mutant protein was overexpressed. Therefore, we can conclude that CPX, this mutation was a gain of function allele. Next, uh, we show that the overexpression of the three dominant CPXA star mutations conferred resistance to some but not all antibiotics. What is shown here is that these three uh, mutant proteins promote resistance to aminoglycoside, represented with gentamicin and amikacin, 
as well as beta lactams represented here by uh, with imipenem and ceftazidim. And this effect was not shown uh, when the wild type CPXA was overexpressed, indicating that the increased uh, resistance really resulted from the activation of the CPX system. In addition, we found that the removal of the regulator uh, CPXR completely abolished the resistance conferred by CPXA star. And this demonstrated that resistance was really due to a non-pathway um, um, phosphorylation of uh, CPXR concomitant to changes in the CPX regulon. And therefore, what we did next is that we look, uh, we search for these regulon members. Um, so we, to do this, we used a candidate approach um, and here we either overexpressed down-regulated genes um, that are known to be targeted by the CPX system or um, created non-mutation of upregulated genes in both the wild type and the CPXA star background. Uh, and here we really focused on two genes, uh, namely uh, OMPEF, which encode um, the major proin in uh, E. coli, as well as ACRD, which encode uh, a specific efflux pump in E. coli as well. So what was known before is that the CPX system regulates the uh, expression of outer membrane porins, OMPEF and OMC in E. coli. So here we tested uh, we did Western blot analysis that shows that the OMPEF level is really affected uh, from the expression of CPXA star with a significant decrease in OMPEF levels. And on the right, you can see that the overexpression of OM35, which is the OMPEF ortholog from Enterobacter aerogenes, and this was expressed from an IPTG inducible promoter. This restored um, um, susceptibility to beta lactams, suggesting that the, the reduction of OMPEF in CPXA star background was responsible for the resistance to this class of antibiotics. And this was also consistent with the fact that OMPEF is the preferred route for the translocation of beta lactams across the outer membrane. And second, we looked at ACRD which is uh, an efflux transporter and as we can see here the removal of acrd um, restored susceptibility to aminoglycoside suggesting that increased acrd level may contribute to the resistance to aminoglycosides in cpxa star backgrounds so from this result we can go to a uh, first conclusion we shown that the mutation Y144 to N was a gain of function mutation that was able to regulate the expression of the CPX regulon. We show that it induces resistance to some antibiotics, including uh, aminoglycosides through the overexpression of the specific uh, ACRD drug efflux transporter, and to beta lactams through uh, downregulation of OMPEF. But then what we wanted to know is how, um, how this uh, mutation impact um, the CPX system um, and, and do some biochemical characterization of this mutation and compare the biochemical activity of CPXA wild type to uh, CPXA uh, Y144-2N. So, uh, as you may know, protein kinases of uh, two component regula regulatory systems have three types of activity that are important for signal transduction. The first activity is the autokinase activity. And here, so the, the kinase will autophosphorylate on a conserved uh, histidine residue. The second activity is the kinase activity. So uh, once it is activated, the kinase will phosphorylate um, a, um, a response regulator on a conserved uh, aspartate uh, residue. But what, what is also important is a phosphatase activity 
because when there is no signal or when the signal is removed, then the system has to go, to go back to a rest, resting uh, state. And therefore, the phosphatase activity of the kinase is important. So uh, this is what we wanted to, to test. And another uh, thing that is important concerning the CPX system is that the, the activity of, of, of CPXA is known to be uh, downregulated by direct interactions with the CPXP proteins protein in a periplasm. And so to test uh, these uh, all these different activities in vitro, I first cloned, overexpressed, and isolated uh, the three proteins, so CPXA wild type, CPXA star, and CPXR as fusion proteins with uh, six acidin tag at their C terminus. So for each activity to be tested, I set up specific assay and we will go through all these assay um, together. So uh, on this slide, you can see uh, on the right panel, uh, the expression of CPXA and CPXA star in bacterial lysates after uh, three hours of induction at 30 degrees. And on the left panel, um, proteins purified by affinity chromatography on a nickel column after solubilization of, of the membranes using 1% dodecyl maltoside. However, uh, even if the protein looks um, quite pure, a major complication was that the proteins uh, precipitate uh, within the few days at four degrees. Therefore, we uh, rather use inverted membrane vesicle for um, the subsequent assays. At the opposite, the purification of CPXR from the soluble fraction of the bacteria was pretty straightforward. So, um, so as I said, due to the difficulty of purifying CPXA, we used inside-out uh, inner membrane vesicle, vesicles enriched in uh, ISTAG CPXA or CPXA star. And we first uh, quantified the autokinase activity of CPXA using a commercial assay, which is called the ADP glucokinase assay. As you can see on this slide, um, this assay is very simple and is performed in three uh, steps. So first, after uh, the kinase reaction in the presence of ATP, the ADP glow reagent is added to deplete the remaining, the remaining ATP. And then the kinase detection uh, reagent is added to convert uh, ADP into ATP. And then eventually, ATP is quantified by a luciferase luciferin reaction that will emit a bioluminescent signal. Then the light um, generated correlates to the amount of ADP generated in the kinase assay, which is indicative of the kinase of activity. And when the two proteins were incubated with ATP, what we found is that similar um, levels of ADP were generated. Thus, this indicated that the two proteins catalyze autophosphorylation and that the Y1442N substitution does not modify the autokinase activity of CPXA, but at least in vitro. Then to test the kinase activity of CPXA on the CPXR response regulator, I then used a phospho, a phostag um, page um, technology. The phostag molecule that you can see here binds uh, specifically to phosphate ions and therefore in a SDS page uh, gel, the phosphorylated proteins will be uh, delayed. So you can differentiate the phosphorylated from the non phosphorylated proteins. This is what is shown here. So first the kinase um, activities were tested by using uh, inner membrane, uh, so inverted membrane vesicles and purified uh, CPXR um, protein. On the left, uh, phosphorylated um, CPXR was phosphorylated uh, in vitro by using a small donor uh, molecule such as acetyl phosphate. 
And we can use that as a positive control for the migration of CPXR versus uh, CPXRP. However, what we can see on the following lanes is that uh, the, the mutation Y1442N did not increase the kinase of activity of CPXA on CPXR. Here you have CPXR and here CPXRP and the two uh, proteins are visible um, when, the, when CPXR is incubated rather with CPXA or CPXA star. And on the right, you have here the results for the phosphatase activities that were tested by using, uh, again, uh, inverted membrane vesicles and phosphorylated CPXR. However, what we can see here is that similar amount of phosphate were measured using a phosphate uh, coli uh, colorimetric assay. So altogether, um, all these results um, from in vitro assay suggest that CPXA wild type as well as CPXA star behave similarly. So as I mentioned earlier, um, CPXA, CPXP interactions also dis dictate uh, the activation status of the CPX system. We know that the overproduction of this small uh, periplasmic CPXP protein inhibits the CPX response and prevent CPX activation. Also, we know from the literature that uh, CPXP interacts with the sensor, the periplasmic sensor domain of CPXA in unstressed uh, cells, and also that CPXP inhibits uh, CPXA autophosphorylation in reconstituted protein liposome um, in by direct interaction. Uh, as a last thing that is important is that a, a peptide array suggests that the C-terminal uh, uh, of CPXA uh, sensor domain is important for the interaction with CPXP. And because this domain contains uh, the residue Y144, we therefore invest investigated the impact of the Y1442N substitution on the ability of the sensor domain of CPXA to interact with CPXP. And for this, we used a bacterial 2 hybrid assay. So the bacterial 2 hybrid assay is based on the functional complementation of two uh, subdomain of the adenylate cyclase from Bordetella pertussis, the T25 um, and T18. And this interaction results in a CMP synthesis and therefore uh, activation of the lactose operon in an appropriate adenylate cyclase deficient uh, reporter strain. So what we did here is that we co-transformed uh, CPXP uh, fused to T18 and C the CPXA uh, sensor domain to um, T25 uh, and tested uh, their ability to metabolize XGAL um, on supplemented uh, LB plate. And what we found here is that the co-expression of the two proteins um, but not that of the CPXA star protein resulted in blue colonies. And this suggested that the Y1442N substitution disrupts uh, the interaction with CPXP and thus uh, likely, likely explain the constitutive activation of this mutation in vivo. So to confirm this, we analyzed the uh, phosphorylation status of CPXR in intact E. coli cells by co-expressing the histag uh, CPXR together with CPXA wild type or CPXA star, and then used the FOSTAG page system followed uh, by a Western blot with histag antibodies. And here the phosphorylated CPXR was only detected in cells expressing the mutant, but not the wild type CP CPXA. So as a second conclusion, we can uh, conclude that in resting state, uh, CPXP interact with the periplasmic sensor domain of CPXA and keeps the system inactive. 
Here, the mutation Y144-2N abolished this uh, CPXA-CPXP interaction and thus activates CPXB, C CPXA sorry, and stabilizes CPXR to uh, regulate the expression of target genes. So finally, um, uh, an unsolved question in our story was uh, the nature of the signal detected by CPXA and the selection of gain mutation, um, gain of function mutations in clinical strain. In other words, um, the question was, what are the disturbance of the, the cell envelope caused by exposure to imipenem that can be, that, that, that are changing and that be, can be detected by the CPX system? So what we know from the literature is that um, Enterobacter and Klebsiella species of bacteria, but not E. coli, harbor um, a chromosomal uh, inducible MC beta lactamase. Also, although uh, MC is produced at very low uh, level in wild type cells, cultured under uh, laboratory conditions, its expression is highly inducible in the presence of uh, certain beta lactams that we call uh, the, the MC inducers, such as uh, cefoxitim, but also imipenem. And uh, the, the MC uh, induction mechanism is very complex, but um, involves at least three proteins that are linked to the peptidoglycan biogenesis. And these proteins are um, the MR, uh, regulatory uh, factor. Um, another protein that is not shown here, but it's called MD. It's a cytoplasmic uh, amidase. And a third protein, which is here, MD, um, is it's an inner membrane permease. And in the current model, under uh, non-inducing conditions, the muropape peptides that are normally uh, degraded during the, the cell cycle are removed from the cell wall and transported back in the, in the cytoplasm via the MG permease. In the cytoplasm, they are cleaved by MD, MD to generate free peptide uh, that are recycled for new cell wall synthesis. Okay, but this is under uh, non-inducing condition. Under inducing condition, the MD um, uh, enzyme is unable to, to process high level of neuropeptide, which interact then with MR, creating a, confirm a confirmation that will be able to activate the transcription of MC. Therefore, uh, in clinical strain, high level of resistance to beta lactams is generally due to a derepression of MC mainly resulting from MD mutation, but it was not the case uh, here. So far, um, our results show that the expression of CPXA in E. coli provided some resistance to beta lactam, but not to the level that was observed in Enterobacter clinical strain. And this suggested that uh, addition, an additional uh, mechanism was induced in this strain. So uh, first, what, what we did is we confirmed uh, the link between imipenem, the MC uh, beta lactamase, and CPX in the series of clinical isolate. What you can see here is that the strain P4, which carries the CPXA star mutation, isolated during treatment with imipenem, exhibit a very strong beta lactamase activity. In addition, we, we found that this activity corresponds uh, to MC activity because it is, it's specifically uh, inhibited with boronic acid, but not by uh, a mixture with uh, tazobactam and clavulanate, which uh, rather ex uh, inhibits broad spectrum beta lactamases such as uh, TEM3. So uh, then we next uh, examined in, in more detail the interplay between imipenem, CPX, and MC in E. coli. 
Here what we did is that we cloned the AMP RC operon from uh, Enterobacter aerogenes. And in this plasmid, we used uh, to transform a different background of E. coli. The beta-lactamase activity was monitored by using nitrosephine, which is a non-antibiotic beta-lactam that produces a red color upon degradation. And the graph that you can see here represents uh, the absorbance at, um, at uh, 490 uh, nanometer over the time when E. coli was treated or not in the presence of sub-inhibitory concentration of imipenem during one hour. So you can see the increase of um, beta-lactamase activity as a nitrosephine degradation. So here again, uh, what we can see is um, the, the increase in MC activity um, in the presence of imipenem in a E. coli wild-type background. Uh, here, the fold of activation was estimated about a 12-fold. In contrast, what we found is that the, the absence of MG or um, that of the CPX-AR system decreased MC induction uh, by uh, 3.5 to 4.5-fold, uh, and the triple mutant uh, showed no in induction at all suggesting that both the MG permease and the CPX system are required for maximal induction of MC. Similarly, uh, the expression of CPXA star resulted in a significant increase in MC activity in the absence, even in, in the absence of imipenem. And finally, uh, what, what is important to, to, to understand is that, so peptidoglycan is a molecule that is constantly remodeled uh, during the cell cycle of E. coli. And there is a balance between the activity of, um, of penicillin binding proteins, which are, um, which are involved in the synthesis of the pep peptidoglycan, but also um, uh, this, this equilibrium with uh, lytic uh, enzymes um, all around the cell cycle. So what we, we, we showed on this slide is that um, we used a result that came from a previous study that reported that simultaneous removal of several PBPs, so penicillin binding protein, compromised um, bacterial mobility as a result of the activation of the CPX stress response. And this in, resulted in the, the, the inhibition of um, flagellar proteins. So the, the results presented here uh, show that AMC activity was increased in this strain, uh, inactivated for several PVPs, as compared to the Y type. In addition, the inactivation of CPXA or uh, MG in this strain um, result in a decrease of induction. So this was consistent with other works that previously linked these two events together, the PBP loss and AMC activation. So altogether, these results really demonstrate that the inactivation of PBP, either by gene deletion, such as here, or by inhibitory interactions with imipenem, can be sensed by the CPX system in the periplasmic space, and that CPX activation provides an adapted response through the induction of MC beta lactamase. So what we think really happens here, that is shown in, on this slide, is that um, upon activation, um, the CPX system then activates um, um, a lytic enzyme called SLT, which is involved in the degradation of the peptidoglycan and then uh, increase level of this specific molecule that can be sensed by CPXA. But we haven't tested that yet. So um, I, I will uh, conclude really soon just to tell you that uh, many studies um, refer to the, the importance of the CPX system uh, to, to antimicrobial resistance, 
as you can see on this slide, many, many papers are published these days. And all this work really linked uh, the CPX stress envelope system to antibacterial resistance. All these works also validate uh, the CPX as a novel therapeutic target, but additional work is now needed to identify the true CPX system molecule um, and understand really how is it detected. And maybe through this identification, we can um, guide the, the development of inhibitor. Okay, I will um, finish with this uh, take home message um, uh, slide. So um, we have a growing body of evidence that links the envelope stress response systems to antibacterial resistance. And this makes them uh, new attractive therapeutic targets. And specifically, the, com the completion of this study also provide a, provides a major step forward in the understanding of, on how this system detects antimicrobial agent and then subsequent uh, envelope defect. Um, and I will uh, end by uh, this, acknowledge uh, uh, this acknowledgement, sorry. Uh, I would like to thank of course, all the team members and um, the fundings that are shown here, and our collaborator at Marseille for um, genomic analysis. And with that, I will end the presentation and um, I'd be very happy to take your questions. Thank you, Michiel. That was really nice, really, really nice. Um, are there questions? Would anybody like to write a question or send uh, questions through the chat in Portuguese or in English? While people are getting ready, um, I'll just jump in for the first question. So from the way you told the story, um, I guess you were surprised, to, well, maybe not too surprised, but did you find that it was um, surprising to find the CPXA mutation and also the um, PMRB and FOQ mutations in the other isolate? And um, did you go for it because of, there was already this link between CPXA and R with membranes and how well, was that? Yeah, uh, I, I, I was, obviously, I was not that surprised, but um, indeed that was the first time where when people isolated mutation in the system and we didn't look at them specifically, but we identified them by, you know, compar comparing the genomes. So we okay. sequenced the whole genomes of these strains and we found these mutations. Yeah, and but why do you think that they're you know they will come up, but they're rare? Uh, well, I don't know if they are rare because uh, the thing is that uh, when you look at um, mutations that are uh, identified in multi-drug resistant strains, at the beginning of of, uh, of the research on multi-drug resistant strains, people really looked at um, you know um, uh, efflux systems. And we know that in enterobacteria, there is a major uh, regulator that is called MAR for multidrug, multiple antibiotic resistance. And people really looked at mutation in this specific operand, but not really elsewhere on the genome. And because now, you know, uh, genome sequencing are, is rather, rather cheap. Um, so we, we can do a world genome sequencing and found this mutation. And I'm pretty sure they are really underestimated. So you think if we take this, uh, like maybe just the periplasmic domain sequence, say with the Y144N mutation and throw it against PDB, your guess is there would be lots of sequences 100% similar? Uh, well, yes, I mean, uh, also uh, mutation can occur elsewhere on the gene. Uh, gain of function mutation can mm -hmm. can can be found elsewhere. But I guess that this mutation and mutations in the sensor domain of CPXA are more prone to to emerge because this is the the, the sensor domain of the of the protein, 
and if the signal is sent from the periplasm and because the periplasm, periplasm is where the, the perturbation of the peptidoglycan happens, then yes, it might be a reason why it happens here. Okay. Um, so there's a question, there's two questions. The first one is in Portuguese, so I'll just read it and try and translate. Um, so during the pandemic, uh, some antibiotics were used trying to um, treat the infections that happened in people that uh, were infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, basically by uh, opportunist, opportunistic pathogens. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is there any research indicating that antibiotic resistance increased during this period? And also, what, um, how worried or what, what are uh, my, uh, the microbiologists' worries in relation to the post-pandemic scenario of, you know, hospital infections and Yes, uh, so I haven't read any serious, I would say, publication about that. Um, I received a project for evaluation on this specific subject, and I think this is really important to do. Okay. But I, I, have, no, I have no real data on that. Yeah. I guess um, in Brazil, I mean, just it's also informal, but um, there are, there is a serious issue with um, hospital infection, um, bacterial infections in people that are in the ICU, mm -hmm. um, ICUs, and so I guess at least proportionately, you know, even if you just it, it maybe not necessarily a greater risk of um, infections happening through MDR bacteria, but just by the raising numbers of people in ICUs, maybe you have a raise in the resistance as well. Um, okay, so that was a question from, sorry, I didn't mention your name, Daniela Tapeci, or Tapeci, not sure how it's pronounced. And there's another question from Sandra. It's yes, a, it's written in English. Yes, I can it? see it, yes. Um, my question will be if it could be comparable to better understand uh, the resistance that occur in Pseudomonas. Yes, indeed, there, there, is, there is such mechanism as well in Pseudomonas. The, the MC also responds to a two-component system, which is not called CPXAR, but it's another one, but it's really similar. And uh, the second question was, and if we have this clinical argument with resistance to imipenem, which is the last line treatment. Uh, there is a last line treatment uh, for this patient and it's called polymyxin, polymyxin B, colistin. Yeah. Thank you, Muriel. Any more questions? Would anybody like to ask a question? People are shy. I have one more question, then see if anybody else gets a little bit more courage, raises, brings up the courage. Yes, yeah, so let, let, let me have something to, um, I'm curious with the work of Muriel. So, Muriel, a uh, very nice talk, very interesting result. Uh, I'm curious about uh, some, some piece of work that appeared some years ago about synthetic bacteria. So, uh, what about the possibility to work with synthetic bacteria? Um, you, you, uh, in your uh, experimental work, uh, you work with Echericha coli and, and you uh, you did some experiment with uh, uh, yeast and two hybrid system. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what's the possibility to work or to modify Enterobacter uh, to work uh, directly with Enterobacter? Yes, indeed. Um, but the thing is that if you want to really work with the strain that are drug resistant, then 
you cannot really modify the genome because you're stuck, you know, you cannot select for mutate resistance, basically, because all the markers of resistance are already there. So that's why E. coli, I mean, it's, it's a good model to then reintroduce individual mutation in like a naive background and look, look at the, the, the effect on in, in E. coli. So it's, it's more convenient, I, I agree. But it would be better to work with the enterobacteria directly, but it's hard. Uh, and, and what about synthetic bacteria? Uh, do you know uh, people are working with that or is too uh, uh, expensive to work with that? I don't know. Maybe I, I can contact them and see if, if we can do something together because, yeah, I, I never tried, but why not? Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mujer, what I was going to ask is, uh, I forgot to mention when I was presenting you that you're also a research associate at Synchroton Soleil. So, this is a beamline near Paris for mm -hmm. X-ray crystallography. Um, and so, I guess you, 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 you might be able to know uh, if um, in your slide you showed CPXP as a 3G structure. So, I'm guessing there is a 3G structure for CPXP. Uh, but yes, yes, two groups uh, actually crystallize and solve the the structure of CPXP. Because the I don't know how big is the periplasmic domain domain of CPXA, um, but it's very short. Is it no, it's very short. Okay, mm -hmm. so is it known um, how you know how this the how would you guess what the mechanism is for upon CPXP uh, coming off? the uh, signal domain, what happens with CPXA that triggers the transitions that um, result in phosphorylation? Yes, indeed. No, nothing is known, known at all. And um, I, I would like to investigate this aspect uh, later on by doing, uh, you know, in vitro uh, reconstitution. How would you do that? Uh, well, we can, we can uh, we can reconstitute in vitro the entire CPX system and then uh, then look at the deactivation of CPXA uh, in in different uh, conditions. Do people do are, I've just come up the cryo EM. Would it be able to, would people be able to do cryo EM of a CPXP CPXA complex in these uh, reconstituted systems? Uh, yes, why not? We don't have any cryo EM uh, right now at Soleil. It's in, it's a big di discussion, <laughs> but yes, it would be very interesting. Because it, would you be able to? I just don't know anything about like if, if you want to solve structures of um, the say CPXA full length and CPXP, you need the membrane. Can you, do people do it with crystal with crystallography, or do you have to do with the NMR, or what techniques? Uh, we can do that using cryo EM. Actually, um, there there is a technique that is called it's 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 not really a membrane. It's called nano disc, but it mimics the the membrane actually, and it, it seems to work really nicely. Fantastic. Any other questions? Well, Michiel, this was really great. I'm so happy to, I was so happy to see the data and hear you and also to meet you. And would like to thank you so much for coming to talk about our bacterial antimicrobial resistance and bacterial microbi uh, microbiology and biochemistry. Thank you, and um, thank you to the students and guests who came to see us too. I don't know if Marcel would like to say anything. Okay, no, so nice to, uh, to meet you, Muriel, a very nice talk. And uh, we used the, uh, our seminar to talk uh, during the pandemic about the sensation about this time. So I would like to ask you about that. So what are you feeling? How, how was your time in pandemics? And what do you think is the rest of the time at the future? 
Wow, that's a huge question. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, the thing is that I try. You know, it's it's been it's it's been such a long time, um, more than a year, uh, about a year and a half. Um, when when it first happened, um, we we have this diploma that we have to pass in France. Uh, if you want to to have PhD student, you have to write a second thesis. So that's what I did. <laughs> okay. So I, I managed to do that. So now I can I can I can have PhD student with me. That's good. So that's another exam. That's a that's a big big uh, manuscript. And then you have a you have to to present. So that's what I did during the first six months of the pandemics. Uh, and 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 then yes, um, going back with students um, was 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 really strange because we didn't see them at all during this year because i i teach and and um i didn't see my classes at all except uh, in in practical uh, sessions um so that that was really hard uh, for, for for us as teachers and for for them for the students of course uh, but luckily, I had the chance to 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 go to the lab at Soleil for these six last last months and do experiments with uh, my master student, and we did a really good job. Um, for the for the for the future, what I hope is that um, we will not be stuck in this, uh, you know. Uh, um, conference and video conferences in, in really far away from from each other um i guess meeting meet people is very important also to share ideas and um and yes i hope it's going to be better soon okay okay muriel i'm very sorry for my open question but i know <laughs> that it's a strong question but it's very important for everyone uh, to to be resistant with uh, uh, together, so uh, we need to. Uh, uh, it was a challenge, so uh, it, it has been hard for everyone, and we need to know about uh, how the people are resistant to this pandemic. So thank you very much for your thank uh, you. very very good talk, um, very interesting talk, and and good luck with your research, and I hope to see you. Uh, next time uh, uh, in in uh, in vivo, no no uh, uh, no by video conference. Yeah, in vivo, that's a good one. <laughs> like. Well, thank okay. you all. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Teka. Thanks to the student as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, Teka, eh, muito obrigado eh, eh, por pela pela paciência por trazernos uma convidada tão interessante. E, bom, thank you very much for everyone. Um, I, I need to say bye bye for everyone. So, see you, uh, Muriel, Teca. Bye see bye. See bye. <laughs>